Hello, today I'll be doing a, another video on a Halloween type game since we're getting close to Halloween. Mansions of Madness 1st Edition. I know 2nd Edition is all the rage now, but 1st Edition came out in 2011. That's when I got it. I initially played it then, played it again in uh, 2013, and then um, had not played it again since then until I pulled this out a few days ago to play it to do this video. I do have second edition. I've played that a few times, but I um, thought I'd go ahead and do one on first edition since uh, I think it's still uh, a good game and a lot of people don't like to play games with apps, so they may uh, enjoy this one. So uh, let's get started with how to set it up. So this is a one versus mini game. One player will play the keeper and all the other players will play the investigators. Um, so um, of course they'll be trying to beat the keeper and the keeper will be trying to defeat them. So the first thing that happens is the investigators need to choose uh, one of the stories to play. We'll start with, uh, we'll go ahead and talk about uh, and do a kind of a set up for story one, The Fall of the House of Lynch. After the players have cho chosen a story, then they'll decide who wants to be the keeper and all the other players will be the investigators, as I said. Then, then you'll take out all the monster figures and place them somewhere near the board, um, as well as all the tokens, separate all the tokens by different pipe types and place them somewhere near the board. You'll take the different puzzle pieces and sort them by type and place them face down somewhere near where the in the play area. The investigator players will take all the character cards, straight and uh, trait and starting item cards. Um, they'll need those when they're doing the investigator uh, setup. The keeper player will take the mythos, exploration, lock. Uh, keeper action cards, um, obstacle, objective, and trauma cards, and just put those all over in his area. He'll need those when he does the keeper setup. Uh, the keeper player will take the event deck. He'll look for the ones that have an image on the back that match the story that's being played. So we said we're playing the fall of the house of Lynch, so he'll look for this image on the back of the event cards. Like this, so you'll see that matches, so that goes with the fall of the house of Lynch. He should have five of them and place them in order with one on top, then two, then three, then four, then five. Nobody should look at the uh, front of the event deck at this time, and so just set that aside. The keeper will want to place the three monster or the three combat decks near him. You got humanoid, beast, and eldritch, um, and then the trauma deck. Um, these in the rules, I did not find where it said to shuffle these, but I believe they should be shuffled and then placed somewhere near the keeper player where he'll be able to grab them. Then the investigator players will find the uh, map tiles that they need as shown in this map setup and build the map and place uh, the tokens shown like the barrier will be placed in this room, the altar will be placed in this room, hiding space in this room and the sealed door tokens will be placed to show that uh, these doors are sealed. So the investigators should build out this map. Again it shows what map tiles they need. So let me get that done. All right. So you'll see I have the map built as shown uh, for the story of the House of Lynch. Again, these are sealed door markers, so those doors cannot be used during this game. They're blocked off. There's also a hiding space. We'll talk more about what that is later, a barrier and an altar. And again, when we're getting into the how to play, we'll talk about what effect those have on gameplay. Each investigator chooses an investigator to play. I'm playing a three-player game, so one will be the keeper. I'll have two investigators. Um, so we'll just say one will be Ashcan Pete, and one will be uh, Jenny Barnes. These show their health, 
their sanity, um, how many skill point tokens they get, and then there's a little uh, flavor of biography on the back if you want to read that. So, all right, players uh, decide which character card they want, which character they want to be. The remaining car cards are just set aside. They may be used later if uh, if one of the investigators dies. The investigators will look at the uh, corresponding trait cards that go along with that investigator. There'll be uh, two intellect and two strength, and those show their marksmanship, dexterity, um, willpower, lore, and luck. And then there'll be maybe a little ongoing power and an action. They get to choose. Um, two of these, one strength and one intellect. So they'll make a choice and return the other two to the box. So we'll just say we're going to take... Uh, we'll take this one for strength and this one for intellect. We'll return these two to the box. It shows you start the game with your guitar starting item. So Ashken Pete has two starting items, um, depending on which one of those uh, strength cards he took. Since he chose the one that gives him the guitar, he'll take that. And old Duke here will just go back to the box. He also starts with four skill points, so he'll get four skill point tokens. Like so, and we'll talk more about what those are for uh, later. All right, I made the same choices for Jenny Barnes. I chose one strength and one intellect card. Um, the strength card I chose for her gives her her starting item of the 45 automatic, and she gets till two skill points. The investigators will read this uh, text here, the story so far, and they'll also place their starting figures on the start space, you'll see on the map diagram, it shows the start space here in the foyer or foyer. So here's my Ash Ken Pete starting figure <clears throat> and my uh, Jenny Barnes starting figure. <clears throat> of course, these figures do not come painted as usual. Uh, I, back in 2011, I did my uh, normal mediocre paint job on all these monsters and figures. Um, but... As I always say, I think it looks better than the gray plastic it normally comes with. So that's the start space. So that's it for the investigator setup. Simultaneously, the keeper player will be looking in this keeper's guide for his setup instructions. Um, this kind of just gives a little bit. We'll look for the story one, the fall of the House of Lynch, and he'll follow that setup information. I don't want to show it and give away uh, any secrets, so I'm going to kind of blur that, but I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about how this setup works. So first there will be some uh, story questions that the Keeper's Guide will ask, and the Keeper will have uh, several, you know, number one tokens with like A, B, C answer, number two, number three, and if there's more questions, four and five. And he'll answer those questions and take the corresponding token of how he answered it. So if he answered question one with choice A, he would take that marker. If he answered question two with choice B, he would take that marker. And in Fall of House of Lynch, there's only three questions. So if, say, he answered choice three with choice B, he would take that. Again, I just don't want to show the questions because I don't want to have any spoilers if somebody is going to play this game for the first time. So after you answer the three story questions, you take the uh, tokens you used that correspond to your answers. Keeper will keep those in his play area in case he has to refer back um, because he doesn't remember how he answered. Your exploration cards have items and uh, other things, but they also have your story clue cards. You'll want to find the the ones that correspond to the story you're doing and the answer that the answers that you gave so you'll find the ones that match the answers you gave and put those in your play area and return the others to the box so for instance I answered 1A so I take the fall of the house of Lynch 1A clue card 
2B, so I take follow the house of lynch 2B clue card, and I answered 3B to the question, so I take the follow the house of lynch uh, 3B clue card. Then the story setup will tell, tell the keeper what items to take here. And those are found out of the other exploration de deck here, so let me find those. So you get those from the exploration deck, all the items that were listed in there. Uh, and um, some of them will be, uh, you found nothing of interest. Um, set all those aside, all the other exploration cards that were not used can just be returned to the box. It then tells you which obstacle in the keeper setup. It tells you which obstacle cards to get. It said to get these three again so that I'm not showing spoilers. I don't want to show what they are, but it shows what obstacle cards to get there. The unused obstacle cards can just go back to the box. Keeper setup also tells you which locked cards you'll need for this um, story. So. I've got those here. Again, for no spoilers, I'm not going to show the other side of them at this time. When we go through some example rounds, you will see some of these because I'll have to flip them over. So there will be some spoilers. I just don't want to um, show too much. And, you know, I know this game is 12 years old already. Um, so everybody that probably wants to play it has probably already played it. But again, just in case, I don't want to show that. All right, then the keeper guide also uh, tells the keeper how to build his mythos deck. He chooses the mythos cards with these symbols on them um, and shuffles them all together and creates his mythos deck. So you can see the front side of the mythos cards have that sim those symbols on the bottom, so I just need to find the ones that correspond to what's shown for this story, get them all, and uh, shuffle them together to form the Mythos deck and any unused cards can just be returned to the box. Alright, so there's my Mythos deck. Again, they have the symbols that were shown in the Keeper Guide. I've shuffled that together and formed my Mythos deck. Next you'll get your objective cards and find the one that matches your story marker 1 for the story you're going to play. So, so I answered question or answered A for question one, so I find objective one A for Fall of the House of Lynch. Again, I don't want to show it. All the other objective cards can just re be returned to the box. I'm just putting all my stuff that's returned to the box back up here. The keeper can immediately read um, this objective card uh, to see how the players win. Um, and uh, and how he wins, but the investigators won't know that until they reveal this clue or until the fourth event from the event deck is revealed. Then the keeper will reveal what the entire uh, objective card says. Next, the keeper will seed uh, his cards on the board. All his lock, objective, exploration cards, the Mythos deck can just go in his play area. And I can just show an example from the example in the uh, Keeper Guide here. Now, what it, the Keeper Guide will really show here under Fall in the, Fall in the House of Lynch, what, how to seed it. But the way it works is it'll say a room like this. So looking at this example in the book, you can see how it works. It'll show you what room, so master bedroom, if you answered A to question 3, um, we answered B to question 3, but so we would actually do what's down here, but this is just an example. If you answered A, you'd put the magic phrase uh, card on the bottom of your stack. You'd put your answer clue 2 on top of that. You'd put the puzzle box objective card on top of that. And finally, the locked door on top of that. Place them all uh, face down in the master bedroom. And you do that for each room that is uh, listed here. And it shows what cards go there. So I'll go ahead and do that. And get that set up and come back. So for instance, for the ceremony room, it told me to use this objective card and this lock card. 
So I put the objective card on the bottom, the lock card on top. Again, I don't want to show what they are. And then you just place them in the room. It doesn't matter which space. It does say place it near the, the room title there. After you've placed all those listed, after you've seated all the listed cards, you'll still usually have some exploration cards left over, and with those you place one in each room that doesn't have anything. So for instance here, in the die, you shuffle them up and then place them randomly. So one in there, one in there, place one in there, place one in there. And it doesn't look like there's one here in the hallway. There's not one here in the foyer or foyer. It can go in any of the spaces. It just matters that it's in the room, and this is all one large room. Uh, we need one here in the uh, laboratory, one here in hallway two. Let's get that. I say I've got one left over. Where am I missing? Oh, here in the entryway. All right. Now, looks like all the rooms have an exploration card. You have to be very careful when you're seeding those cards and make sure you do it correctly because if, you, if the keeper does that wrong, that can uh, completely mess it up where the scenario is not winnable. Alright, a few things left to do. It tells me what keeper action cards to get. I need command... Uh, monster, but that's a misprint. It's a, it's actually Command Minion. Um, and then Evil Presence, Maniac Attack, Take Sample, and Uncontrollable Urges. Alright, so I've got those there. All the other Keeper Action cards can just go back to the box. Claim the Objective card matching uh, my story, which is 1A. That tells me how I win and how the players win as we've already discussed and then I gotta take my starting cards draw one mythos card and gain one threat so I'll draw one mythos card into my hand which I would keep secret I'm gonna put face up here and then I gain one threat which is these tokens so I'll just put that in my play area here I've also shuffled and set my combat decks uh, over here somewhere near the keeper the four different types of spell cards um, should be shuffled uh, by their type. So there's four different types, but you shuffle each one because they don't all have the same effect. Make sure you keep them face up, don't look at the backs of them, and put them in uh, their respective stacks. So four of those, and they should be placed somewhere near the investigators as they can acquire those spells. Then after all the players are ready, the keeper will read this pl prologue out loud, and then depending on what his answer uh, to question three was for this scenario, he'd read either this or this out loud as well. And what that will do is give a clue to the investigators or where, where they need to start uh, looking um, for their first clue in the mansion here. So we can just read that out loud. You know, after all players finish setup, read the following. Light rain falls on your face as you exit your car in front of the estate. The house is huge, unkept, and shrouded in eerie silence as you approach. You rap on the door, and there is no response. A moment later, the door creaks open on its, of its own accord, and you enter the foyer of enormous mansion. And, you know, we chose 3B, so then he would, the keeper would read this. Although the house is ancient, it doesn't make a single groan. It feels like the house is holding its breath, waiting for something awful to happen. The silence is suddenly shattered by a blood-curdling scream echoing from the direction of the laboratory. The house shakes like there is an earthquake, and dusty paintings fall off the walls. So that should give some kind of clue to the investigators of where they need to head um, to start their investigation. And that is it. We've completed setup. And now we will move on to how to play. All right, so the game is played in rounds. Each round, the investigators will take uh, 
their turn and once each of the investigators has had a chance to take a turn then the keeper will take take his turn and that will end the round and then you start a new round and you keep doing that until somebody has won the game and the winning conditions are on the objective card so as i mentioned the keeper the investigators always go first and they can take their turn um, in any order they decide their order um, you know each round what order the investigators want to go in if they can't uh, come to a decision then they just go in clockwise order starting with the player to the left of the keeper but I would say normally they'll come to a decision on what order they want to go that round so let's talk about what an investigator can do on their turn so on an investigator's turn they get two movement steps and one action step and they can move twice and then take their action or take their action and then move twice or move once take an action and then move again so they can split that up however they want but again it's two movement steps and one action step so let's talk about a, what a movement step is so when a, a investigator moves using one of their movement steps they can move to one adjacent space so the spaces are separated by these white lines that you can see on the tiles or they're separated by doors like here so that's a this guy this is all one space here and they can move diagonally so you know this guy for one of his movement steps could move here that's one space um, for another movement step, he could move here. So moving between doors like this, um, that's one space. So it's either separated by a white line or between doors. Now, you could not move from here to here, um, separated from a wall. That's not adjacent. That's not an adjacent space. So it has to be separated by a door. And, of course, it can't be a sealed door. So even though there's a, a door here uh, during setup, a sealed door token was placed on there so that is not an adjacent space but this would be adjacent for one movement and then you can see there's a white line here so that would be one movement to move there down here you can see these lines that separate the spaces so that would be one movement to move there another movement to move there or one movement to move through this door into this room so again the white lines separate spaces or doors that are not sealed separate spaces now you'll notice that some of these rooms have a lock card in them so it doesn't matter the space it's in the room so this is all one room so if you tried to move from this room in here or this room in here and there's a lock card like that you can't when you try to move in there instead the keeper will reveal that lock card and read what it says and there may be some puzzle or a key or something that's required to um, bypass that lock if the investigator does not have that or isn't able to solve the puzzle then that um, just spins their one of their movement and they're not able to uh, move in that turn or they're not able to move into that room and as I mentioned again, you know, just because that card is over in that space looks like he could not move in there. The lock is for the whole room. Not so if he attempted to move in there, the keeper would flip the lock and then read it and see what has to be done to actually get in there. And then once the lock card is revealed, um, it's placed face up on top of the stack of cards in that room. Um, if the investigators, if the investigator or investigators, whatever, trying to enter that room, weren't able to um, do what is necessary to discard that lock, that card just stays face up on that stack of cards, and that lock remains in play until a player is able to solve the puzzle or um, uh, has the key or whatever is necessary to discard that lock card. Um, once it is discarded, then players can move into that room. We'll talk more about puzzles later. And I will mention that monsters um, that are on on the board um, can freely move 
into locked rooms. They don't have to solve a puzzle or anything. Um, they can just move into a locked room as if there was no lock. And we'll talk more about monster movement later. And for an another example of a lock, there's a lock here in the garden tile, so that means this door is locked. So if an investigator attempted to come out of this uh, entryway room out into the garden tile, of course it's locked, so the keeper would flip over the lock card and they wouldn't be able to come out there until they resolve that lock. All right, so we've talked about movement, um, which we said on the investigator's turn they get two movement steps and one action step. So let's talk about um, what a player can do for an action. One thing a player can do for an action is uh, what's called the run action. And basically, that's just letting them move one extra adjacent space. So if they spent, you know, uh, one, two to move in here, they could spend their action to run, which allows them to move one adjacent space. They may, an investigator may have a card ability such as this that says action on it. And that says move one monster one space towards you or discard this card to attack a monster in that space. So if a player has a card that says action on it, they can do whatever that action is for their one action on their turn. A player can do a drop action. For a drop action, the player can drop any starting item cards they have um, and any uh exploration cards that they've picked up that may be items like weapons or something they can uh, do a drop action and drop any of those um, exploration cards they have exploration items they've picked up or their starting item and when they do they just place them face up on any other exploration cards that are in the room they're in and those can later be picked up by any other investigator but that is your action to drop items and then, I, as I said, any investigator can later, if they do an explore action on their turn, they can pick up any of those dropped items. Um, so, since I mentioned the explore action, let's talk about what that is. So, when a player explores a room, again, they don't have to be in the space that the cards are, are laid in when they explore a room. In fact, this card would probably be over here because it's supposed to be placed by the name of the room but again it doesn't matter what space the investigator is in as long as they're in the room where the exploration cards are if they explore the room the keeper will reveal the exploration that cards in that room uh, one at a time the keeper will flip over the top one read what it is have it to the give it to the investigator the investigator has to put it in their play area um, as inventory that they're carrying unless it's an exploration the card that says nothing of interest and then that's just discarded it means you didn't find anything but after the first card is revealed if there's more than one card in there the keeper will turn that that over and read what that is and give it to the investigator now one difference is if you uh, reveal an exploration card or an obstacle card like these they have this back on them when you explore and the keeper flips over that obstacle card usually there's going to be something like a puzzle or something that the investigators have to resolve before they can go on um, remove that and go on looking at any other exploration cards underneath there so the different types of exploration cards you might find are, of course, those that say nothing of interest, which are just useless. Um, there's the clues, which uh, that's really what the investigators are looking for to help them. You know, clue, first clue they find will help them give them some idea of where to go to find the next clue, which will uh, give them some idea to find the next clue, which will ultimately hopefully lead them um, to win the game at least in this scenario there's only three clues um, you might find items like weapons or keys that will help you unlock locked doors uh, artifacts just different uh, different types of things you might find when you explore a room and the keeper reveals exploration cards 
So that's, again, that's an action, exploring a room. And another action that a player can take on their turn is attacking a monster. So if a player attacks a monster, they can attack either with a spell that they might have that allows them to attack. For instance, you'll see these say, choose a monster within two range. Um, and test this one's test lore minus one or you may have a weapon like uh, he has this guitar where he can um, discard it to attack a monster in his space or you can just attack with your bare hands uh, here Jenny has this uh, weapon where she can attack a monster within two range if the monster is if one within one range she gets plus two marksmanship we'll talk more about combat later but i just wanted to mention one action that a player can take on their turn is to attack a monster and in fact attacking a monster is the only action that a player can take if there is a monster in his space unless he uh, evades the monster so if you try to do an action other than attacking the monster when it's in your space, then you first have to ev evade the monster. And we'll talk about uh, evading just here in a second. So before we talk about evading, let's talk about attribute tests. So each investigator has attributes, strength, marksmanship, dexterity, intellect, willpower, lore, luck. Um, and so throughout the game, the investigators will be uh, asked to perform some attribute tests that may say like test strength. So when you test uh, an attribute, you roll a ten-sided die, and to be to su be successful and pass the test, your result must be uh, equal to or less than your attribute in that. So in this case, you would want to. If you were testing strength, you would want to roll a six or less on the ten-sided die. So I would, in that case, I would just fail that test. And usually, whatever is requiring you to test, um, either a card or um, something, will tell you what the effect is if you pass and what the effect is if you fail. Some tests may say. Uh, like test strength minus one. So first you would subtract one from whatever your strength is. So in this case it would be a five. So you would have to roll a five or less to be successful. So in that case I would pass the test. And that could be against any attribute, strength, as I said, any of these, marksmanship, dexterity, intellect. It depends on what's requiring you to take the test. Now each investigator starts the game with a number of skill points like uh, Ash Can Pete here started with four Jenny already only started with two you can when you're taking a, a test when you're testing an attribute before you roll the die you can discard one of these skill points to add your luck to your attribute so if I was testing dexterity well, I probably wouldn't do it for dexterity since I've already got a 7, but maybe if I was testing intellect, um, I didn't think I'm going to pass since my attribute is only 3, so it would be hard to roll a 3 or less. I could discard one of my skill point tokens and then add my luck to my attribute, so I could add my 3 luck to my intellect of 3, so I would have a total of 6 that I would be testing against instead of just 3. But of course you're limited to do in that um, by the number of skill points you have. You can also use skill points when attempting to solve a puzzle, but we'll talk more about that when we're uh, talking about puzzles. All right, so now that we've talked about attributes test, attribute test, let's talk about evading. Remember I said when a player wants to do an action, when there's a monster in their space, any action other than attacking that monster, they'll have to evade that monster. So if Ashcan Pete started his turn and he wanted to move out of here or explore the room before he could do that, because there's a monster in his space, and the space is divided by this white line, um, he would have to evade it before he could do any other action. So to do that, he has to do an evade test. 
So when you evade something, you're testing your dexterity. So for Ashcan Pete, his dexterity is 7. Um, but it's modified by the monster's awareness, which is this number up here. So this, you can see, it's a zombie monster, and then it's got a 1. So because he's slow, he actually gets to add 1. You know, zombies are kind of slow, so he gets to add 1 to his dexterity. So he would actually be testing against a dexterity of 8. Some may have a negative number there, um, which actually would subtract from your dexterity. So this number up here is the monster's awareness. It also tells what type of monster it is by the color. So that blue means it's a humanoid monster. And you can see that that matches the same color as the humanoid uh, monster combat deck there. So if it had a brown color up there, that would be a beast monster. And if it had a green green color up here, that would be an eldritch monster, and it would use eldritch combat deck. But again, we'll talk more about combat in a, in a minute. We're just talking about evading here. So again, when you're going to evade something, you test your dexterity, modified by the monster's awareness. In this case, a zombie, it actually adds one to his awareness. Um, <clears throat> I mean, to his uh, dexterity, so he would be testing. He just needs to get an eight or less. He would fail. Always when you're testing, uh, a 1 is always a, a success, and a 10 will always be a failure. And as you can see, I am not rolling good here. If you fail uh, to evade like I just did right there, which was almost impossible for me to do, but I did it. If you fail to evade... The keeper can have the monster damage you by its damage, which is shown on the bottom of this uh, monster token here. So There's this text on here, which usually if the monster performs its special attack. But this is the monster's damage, so if I failed to evade, like I just did, the keeper could have the monster do two uh, damage to me. This number here is the monster's health, how much damage the monster uh, must take before it is killed. Then after I take that damage for failing the evasion, I can still go on and do whatever I was going to do. So if I was moving, I could go on and move, or if I was exploring, I could go on and do that. Uh, I just have to face the consequence of taking the damage for failing to evade. If you pass... Um, the evasion test, then there's you don't take any damage and you can go ahead and do whatever you were trying to do, like explore or move. If there are multiple monsters in your space, then you have to evade each one of them, one at a time. You choose the order uh, before you can go on and do whatever action you wanted to do uh, besides attacking a monster. So if he was trying to move out, he would have to evade the monster and the cultist. You can see the cultist actually subtracts one from his dexterity. Um, but you test one at a time and so you may take damage multiple times if you fail multiple tests. And to mention one more time, if you are attacking a monster for your action then you don't have to uh, do an evade test even if there's multiple monsters in your space. If you're attacking a monster, no evade test. Even if you're not attacking a monster in your space. If you had a ranged weapon and you were attacking a monster in a space like over here, um, you still don't have to evade the monsters that are in your space. Another type of test um, you might make pretty often is a horror test. Whenever a monster enters or is placed in a room with an investigator in the room not in their space so even if this guy came into walking in this door and he was in a different space as long as they enter the room where the investigator is um, or placed in the room um, where the investigator is the investigator has to immediately make a horror test Unlike an evade test where you're using your dexterity attribute when you're making a horror test, you're using your willpower attribute. 
So in this case with Ashcan Pete, they're the same. He's got a willpower of seven or a dexterity of seven. So you're using your willpower attribute to test against, but it's modified by the monster's horror rating, which is this number here in the bottom right. So in this case, it subtract his horror rating is a negative one, so he would subtract one from Ashcan Pete's willpower of seven, so he would be testing against a six. And <laughs> again, I fail uh, to pass my uh, horror check. If there were multiple investigators in the room, when a monster enters the room or is placed in the room, each investigator has to make a horror test. Now, when you fail a horror test like I did, you have to take one horror. So you take one horror token and place that on your character sheet. And that subtracts from your sanity, which, you know, Ashcan Pete says nine. So because he took a horror, his sanity would now be eight. If you take damage, you take uh, a n number of damage that you took. So, you know, if I took two damage, like um, when I failed that of eight, I would put a two damage on there. And that would subtract from my health. So instead of 11 health, I would only have nine health. If you pass the horror test, then you just don't have to take uh, a horror. If you start your turn with a monster in your room, then you don't have to take a horror test. But if you uh, left the room, you know, used your two move to leave the room, um, and actually that would you'd have to evade <laughs> when you moved here and tried to move again, you'd have to use an evade. But if you leave the room and come back in on your turn, um, then you enter the room where the monster is, then you would have to take a horror test. But if on the keeper's turn he moved the monster out of the room and then back in, you would not have to make uh, an additional horror test. So if he placed him in there and you had to take a horror test and then he moved him out and moved him back, you would not have to take an additional horror test. But if you leave the room and come back, you do have to take an additional horror test. Let's talk about status effects. So some cards or uh, combat or something may cause an investigator to get stunned, in which case they'll place one of these stun tokens on their character card. Uh, when a character is uh, stunned, an investigator is stunned, then they only get one movement step on their turn. They get one movement step and one action instead of two movement steps and one action. Well, there is one other detrimental effect. You get a minus two to all your attributes that you're testing as long as you're stunned. You can get multiple stun tokens placed on you, but that does not stack the effect. So you wouldn't, when you're doing a willpower test, you don't get minus four, you know, since you get minus two, uh, to your attributes when you're testing if you had two stun tokens you don't get minus four uh, the only thing is each uh, round an investigator gets to remove one stone stun token um, so if you still have an additional one then you would still have the effects of being stunned but they don't stack their effects if you have more than one and monsters can also be stunned and monsters that are stunned cannot move or attack, and you also do not have to uh, do evade tests against a stunned monster. Another status effect token um, is fire that, that may be in a room. If your turn or a monster's turn ends and they're in a room with a fire token, they take two damage. Also, if an investigator attempts to enter a room with a fire status token on it, they have to first test their willpower. Uh, if they fail that test, they can still enter the room, but they take one horror. Alright, another status effect token is a darkness status effect group token. Again, those are placed in rooms. If a uh, if an investigator is in a room with a darkness token and they want to explore that room, 
they have to not only spend their action step to do that, they also have to spend one of their movement, one of their two movement steps to explore a room that has a darkness token. Also, if an uh, investigator is in a room with a darkness token, they get a minus two to any uh, attribute test they do in combat with a monster. And that would stack with any uh, other negative effects like a stun, a min minus two they get from a stun token. Uh, if they were in a darkness a, a room, they would also get an additional minus two to any combat attribute test. So before we get to combat, I want to go ahead and talk about what happens on the keeper's turn. So after the investigators have each taken their turn, um, then the keeper will get to take his turn. So the first step of the investigators, or I mean of the keeper's turn, we have the investigator trading step. So again, that's the first step of the uh, keeper's turn is the investigator's trading step. So if investigators are in the same space, they can trade between each other starting items or exploration item cards that they've picked up. Um, they can trade those fee freely between each other. Uh, now you can't drop any items, you can just trade with another uh, investigator in your space. Um, and then also, um, if, you're, if an investigator has a stun token or stun tokens, this is where they get to remove one of them, as in the trading step of the keeper's turn. Alright, so once that's done, we move on to the next step of the keeper's turn. We have the gain threat step. In the green gain threat step, the investigator gains a number of threat equal to the number of investigators who started the game. So um, in this case, that would be two. So the investigator would get to gain two threat, place that in his play area. Threat is what the investigator uses to um, play mythos cards or uh, resolve his keeper action cards. And again, uh, in the gain threat step, he gets to gain a number of threat equal to the number of investigators that started the game. So even if one investigator has been eliminated from the game, um, he would still get, because I started with two, he would still get to gain two threat every threat, gain threat step. All right, next is the keeper action step, where the keeper can use his keeper action cards to do various things, but they cost a number of threat to use them. So like this command minion cards, um, the keeper would have to spend one threat in order to uh, do whatever the action is on this card. For instance, this one allows you to move a monster up to two spaces. You may only use this card once per monster each game round. So that would cost him one threat, whereas if this uh, maniac attack costs four threat uh, for the keeper to do that. But that action is if no maniacs are in play, choose a lone investigator, place one maniac in his space. Otherwise, fully heal a maniac. If he does not have a sample, move him any space. And a sample is something that, uh, again, can be taken uh, if the investigator or the keeper plays this keeper action card. Again, that would uh, take one threat. So, again, during the keeper action step, he can uh, do as many of these actions as he wants, uh, you know, Per the rules of the card as long as he has the threat to do them and once he's done uh, spend all the threat he wants to spend uh, then that ends the keeper action step next we have the monster attack step where the keeper can have a monster attack any uh, investigator in its space if there's two investigators in its space like in this case the keeper chooses one uh, investigator for the monster to attack. If you have multiple monsters around and they're in, uh, they're different, like if she was here and there was a, a witch in the room with her, the keeper could have, you know, the zombie attack Ashcan Pete. After he resolves that, he can have the witch attack Jenny Barnes. So he gets to attack with each monster that has an investigator in their, in their space. 
if there were two monsters in here with Ashcan Pete, then he could attack with each one in his order he chooses. The zombie would attack first, maybe, and then the cultist attack second. If a monster has a stun token on it, then it does not attack, but that at that point, the keeper can remove one of the stun tokens from the monster. Alright, so this is probably a good time to talk about combat, either when an investigator attacks a monster or a monster attacks an investigator. So you'll have combat if either on an uh, investigator's turn they use their action to attack a monster, or on a keeper's turn during the monster attack step if the keeper has a monster attack an investigator. In either case it kind of resolves the same. The keeper will draw a combat card matching the type of monster either being attacked or attacking. And if, in this case, like if Jenny Barnes was attacking the witch, the, her color up there is blue, so she's a humanoid. So the keeper would draw from the humanoid deck. The combat card is broken into two halves. The top half is resolved if the investigator is attacking and the bottom half is resolved if the uh, monster is attacking but the keeper will keep drawing cards until he finds one that matches um, what's actually taking place so for instance if Jenny Barnes was attacking the witch with her taking her action to attack the monster within two range this is a ranged weapon so if the keeper revealed this card it says melee weapon well that's not what we're using so he would keep drawing until he found one that said ranged weapon and then he would read read and resolve this so you hear the gun go off but in your shock you aren't even aware that you fired it so then you test marksmanship marksmanship and then if you pass this happens if you fail this happens so the keeper draws until he finds you know whatever you're attacking with either barehanded or a ranged weapon or a melee weapon and then he reads what happens there if the monster is attacking on the keeper's turn attacking the uh, investigator then the keeper will um, look at the bottom half and he would say oh okay monster attack so uh, you would have to test dexterity and if you pass now this is the the investigator that's being attacked would do this test and then if they pass this happens and if they fail this happens um, there may be um, we haven't talked about these tokens yet, and I will here in a second, but that's like a hiding spot. So if you're in a hiding spot and the keeper wanted to attack, he would have to draw until he found one that said, like, monster versus hiding or something like that. So that's how combat works. It's pretty simple. The keeper draws until he founds, finds a card for the appropriate kind of attack and then you just read and resolve that usually with some kind of attribute test being done by the investigator. Now you know a melee weapon or barehanded weapon usually requires the uh, investigator to be in the same space as the monster but in the case like of Jenny Barnes here she's using, using a ranged weapon so she could attack the monster because this it says attack a monster within two range so that's a number of spaces away so because this monster is one two away Jenny Barnes could attack use her 45 automatic to attack this monster over here though you you have to make sure you have line of sight you cannot trace line of sight through a wall or a door so if Jenny Barnes was here, even though this monster is only one space away, she does not have line of sight to that because it's blocked by these brown walls and this door. In some tiles that have open spaces, you'll have to ch check if you have line of sight. And you do that by these white dots. If at least one of your white dots in your space can connect with a white dot in your target space, without crossing a wall, um, then you have line of sight. So nothing else, uh, other figures, um, monsters or investigators, other artwork on the tile do not interfere with line of sight. The only thing that would interfere with line of sight is a brown wall or a door uh, 
depiction. So, um, again, so even if a monster was here, you can easily see you can trace a line of sight there without crossing anything. So a monster from this space, from this space, would, would be in line of sight. If a room or a tile does not have line of sight dots, then that means every space in that room has line of sight to every other space in that room. So now let's talk about <clears throat> taking damage and killing monsters and investigators. So um, if you're doing combat and you know you did this test, you were attacking with no weapon and you passed, you deal two damage and stun the monster. So when you deal a monster damage, you find um, you know however much that one said two. So I would look through these damage tokens to find one that said two. Of course, first you'd compare it to its health, which this one can take seven. Since I just dealt two, that's not enough to kill it. So you'd put this two in the back of its base right there. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, let's try that again. So you'd put that two in the back of the base right down there. And so that's how much damage it has. Now later, if you dealt an additional damage to it, well, then you'd find a three in here. And put a three in there. And then later, if you dealt an additional two damage, you'd find a five in here and put a five in there. So keep taking it can keep taking damage till it's reached its health, which is seven. Once that monster's taken seven damage, then it's just removed uh, from the game. It's killed. Now when investigators take damage or horror, as I mentioned, um, you find the appropriate token and you know if they took two damage you'd put that on there if you took another damage you'd find a three and put it on there the horror tokens you just accumulate so every time you take a horror you take um, you know put another token there and that subtracts from your sanity investigators will usually take damage from uh, failing evade tests or from monsters attacking them They'll usually take uh, horror from uh, failing horror tests or, you know, some other effect. If an investigator ever takes damage equal to his health, then he's killed. And we'll talk about what happens with a killed investigator in it here in a second. If an investigator ever accumulates horror equal to their sanity, then they're insane. Investigators that in that are insane um, can have trauma insanity trauma cards played on them by the keeper um, we haven't talked about trauma cards yet but we will be here in a little bit but anyway if a if a investigator's um, sanity is zero then they can have insanity um, then they're insane and they can have Insanity cards, uh, trauma cards played on them, which could be a pretty big hindrance to the other uh, investigators. But an investigator only remains insane as long as he um, has zero sanity. If he ever gets to remove a uh, horror token for some reason, then as soon as the number of horror tokens on his card is less than... Um, his sanity then he's no longer insane and once a investigator is insane they have a number of horror tokens equal to their sanity they can't have any more added to them so they can never have more than what their sanity is but if some effect lets them remove one again and then they don't have a horror tokens equal to their sanity then they're no longer insane so let's talk about when an investigator is killed. If their health is ever um, zero, in other words, they have a number of damage equal to their health, then they're killed. All their starting item and exploration cards um, are placed in the room wherever they were killed. They're placed in that room. Their figure is removed from the board. If he had any spell cards, those are not... Um, those are not dropped in the room they're discarded back to the bottom of the pile from whence they came and then all any his character card trait cards uh, 
skill tokens, uh, skill point tokens, they're all dis discarded and all that's removed. Then at the beginning of when his next turn would take place, that investigator can choose a new investigator and set them up just like they did at the beginning of the game. But then they do not get to uh, do any movement or action that turn. So just gaining their new uh, character, um, their new investigator character is their turn. Then on their next turn after that, they can uh, continue as normal. However, if a player is killed and there are no more um, investigators that haven't been used yet in the game, then they're just eliminated, then they can't get a new character. Or if the objective card has already been revealed um, during the game when an investigator is killed, then they cannot come back. They're just eliminated from the game. All right, let's talk about um, some of the cards we haven't talked about yet. So spell cards. Investigators usually don't start with a spell card, but they can gain one. And uh, when they gain it, you know, it tells you when you can use it. So this one can be used as an action. Choose one investigator in your room to heal one horror. Then test lore. Flip this card over and resolve the effect. Um, so then you'd flip it over and it would have some effect. Um, I don't want to spoil by showing that. But each of these would ha could have a different effect on the back. So just because this is the same a soul pact card as this spell card, the whatever is resolved on the back could be completely different than this one. And when you discard a spell card, uh, again, you just discard it to the bottom of the deck from where it came. Now let's talk about Mythos cards. So uh, the investigator will usually start with one or more investigator cards or Mythos cards um, as instructed during the keeper setup. You know, they'll keep them um, secret from the, from the investigators, you know, keep them in their hand. Um, but I'm just laying this out. So Mythos cards, they normally do cost an amount of threat to play, and they can be played on the investigator's turn, but this is the number of threat that it was, is required to play it. And, and they can never be played on the keeper's turn. They're only played on the investigator's turn. And they can be played on an investigator at the start of their turn, or immediately after they've taken one of their movement steps, or immediately after they've taken their action. So at any of those points, um, if the investigator has the amount of threat to discard to play it, he can play it, and then it has, you know, some effect. So this one has a requirement, actually. So besides paying the one threat, um, the investigator would have to be in a, <clears throat> in a basement or any room that has a darkness token. And if that gets played on them, they take one horror. The keeper may then move you up to two spaces. And then after a uh, Mythos card is played, it's discarded. The keeper can gain additional Mythos cards um, in this scenario by using his Evil Presence action card on his turn, which allows him to draw one Mythos card and one drama, Trauma card. So that's how he can get more Mythos cards. And since we've mentioned that that's how um, the Keeper can get Trauma cards, let's talk about those. So here's a couple of sample um, Trauma cards. Um, you have Injury uh, in Trauma cards and Insanity Trauma cards. Injury Trauma cards can be played on an Investigator as soon as they take some damage. Um, insanity trauma cards can be played on an investigator as soon as they take a horror. Now, if they have a number on the top like this, they can only be played on that investigator. Like this one can only be played on the investigator if their health is 8 or less. Um, this one could only be played on an investigator if their sanity was 4 or less. And these stay with the investigator they're uh, played on 
and they're nor normally some negative effect so if you got this one played on you discard one skill point when you receive this card and then you receive minus two intellect to a minimum of one so you would have that um, unless some effect lets you get rid of an injury or insanity card and this one drop all of your starting item and exploration cards in your current room then discard this card so if it doesn't say discard then it stays with you and but an investigator can only have one injury and one insanity card on them um, if another one is played on them then it replaces the one they currently have and they get to get rid of the one they currently have and take the new one and again they they uh, keeper can play those on an investigator when they either take uh, damage they can play this type or when they take horror they can play this type and again there's the restriction if they have a large number like this then their health or sanity has to be equal to or lower than that and um, as I mentioned that the uh, keeper can gain those in this scenario by playing the evil presence uh, action card to draw a mythos and trauma card now the keeper can never have more than four mythos and four trauma cards in his hand at one time so i wanted to mention some of these tokens that we placed on the board this one is an altar so some of the keepers cards um, may interact with that like the take sample card uh, once per turn, choose a monster or an investigator stays, place a token. If the monster is in an altar space at the start of your turn, place the token on the altar and gain five threat. So that's how it comes into play uh, with this card. And other keeper action cards that maybe we don't have in this scenario may use it differently. And even objective and event cards uh, may have some effect with that altar. Alright, we have this token, which I said is a hiding space. An investigator can spend one of their movement points to move on to a hiding space, and then they're hidden. And that just makes them uh, harder uh, for a monster to damage them when they attack. So when a monster is attacking, if they're in a hiding space, the keeper has to draw until he finds like a monster versus hiding and resolve that as effect. But you're less likely to take damage. Um, than if you were just standing out there and getting attacked and you can uh, but when you're in in a hiding space you can't take any actions but on a future turn after you've moved in there on a future turn you can spend a movement to move out or an action to run and move out all right another token we placed um, for this scenario is the barrier an investigator um, can move a barrier that's in their space to block a door in their space for their action. And that prevents anyone from coming in that door, a monster or another investigator, or going out that door. If a monster was in here and wanted to move through that door, when they try their move step, they instead, would, the keeper would draw combat cards until they got one that said monster versus barrier and then see what happens then. Of course, the investigator can on a, another turn spend their action to move that barrier back out into the space. There are some other feature markers similar to those that are not used in this scenario, so I'm not going to go over those now, but if you get the game, you can read what the effect those have. So I need to return uh, to the, I got sidetracked going over combat and other things while I was going over the keeper's turn um, when I mentioned when I was going over their step. So the, after the keeper or the monster attack step in the keeper's turn, the final step is the event step. So during the event step, the keeper will take one of these time tokens and place it on the top of the current uh, event card and if um, the number of time tokens on the event card equals the number shown here then the keeper will flip that uh, event card over and resolve it. The event card may have uh, multiple choices on there depending on a story uh, answer that the keeper 
ch uh, chose and if that's the case he'll only resolve the section according to the um, answer he gave um, and then that's discarded and then the next event card will be there and the keeper will begin placing time tokens on that card um, during his event step so that is that usually if the keeper and the investigators neither one have completed their objective on the objective card by the time the last event card is resolved then both sides lose the game but it may be um, depending on what the objective is it may be that one side may win when the last uh, objective or event card is resolved so it really just depends what's stated on the objective card and the event cards so the one thing we haven't talked about is puzzles there's various types of puzzles I don't even have them all set out here um, but as I mentioned uh, a player may encounter a puzzle when they try to enter a room with a lock or when they have to they uh, explore a room that's got an objective card and that's flipped over and it uh, it may have a puzzle on it and that will place a uh, it'll have a depiction of the puzzle and the player will have to take the puzzle pieces shown on the card um, shuffle them random randomly draw them then the amount of puzzle pieces shown on the card and then they get an attempt to try to solve the puzzle by using their uh, intellect so for instance the uh, Jenny Barnes here has an intellect of, of four. She would get to take four actions to to resolve the puzzle or solve the puzzle. And you can one one type of action is to swap puzzle pieces. Another type is to rotate puzzle pieces. And another type is to draw puzzle pe new puzzle pieces and replace one that's on the board. And I think instead of explaining how puzzles work right here in my rules overview. What I'm going to do is um, just suggest you watch the sample turns, which I'm going to do, and I'll make sure that I get to uh, where I encounter a, uh, a puzzle and um, show how to set that up and resolve it in, this, in the sample turns, because I think it'll just take a little bit too long in my rules overview at this point. But I will show you in the rules, in the rule book here, what kind of puzzles you might encounter. A, a wiring puzzle where you'll get a setup piece and then you have to, uh, you'll, you'll draw pieces randomly depending on the picture on the card. And then you'll have to either rotate or shift or draw new puzzle pieces until you can connect one into the other by, you know, if it's a blue wire's got to connect to a blue wire, a red's got to connect to a red and so forth until you make a good connection like that. You've got lock puzzles like this where you've got to match up the colors so like a green's got to be adjacent to a green and then the red has to be adjacent to a red and then a blue to a blue. Um, so there's and this is not the only kind of lock puzzle and wiring puzzle there is. There's various different setups um, but that's kind of how they work. As you can see, here's another lock puzzle. But basically, you're trying to get the colors lined up to match. And then you also have these that are like a, a image um, where you've got to shift the pieces around to find the depiction of the image as shown on the card. And as I said, if you watch uh, for the example turns, I, I'll be sure that I show at least uh, one puzzle <laughs> one lock or objective card gets revealed that has a puzzle and how we set that up and how the investigators attempt to solve that puzzle. Um, so I think I've gone over most of the rules. Uh, so at this point, I think I'm going to uh, make sure I've got everything set back up how it was right after setup, and then we will go through some example turns. All right, I believe everything is back to how it was right after setup. So uh, we start with the investigator turns. They can decide what order they're going to go in. We'll just say for this round, Ashcan Pete's going to go first, and then Jenny Barnes. 
So um, remember they can take two movements and one action. They can do those in any order. So I think the first thing Ashcan Pete's going to explore for his action. So the keeper would flip over this card. Um, now we, I will say uh, there will be a little bit of spoilers if you're watching this and you don't want to see anything that might happen in this scenario then you probably don't want to watch i'm not going to show everything but there will be a few spoilers because i am going to play a, a few turns so some of these cards and some of the setup will be uh, revealed though some of these things like this will be placed randomly but uh, some of them will not they will be the same each time this scenario is set up so i did want to mention that so there could be some spoilers all right so ashcan pete collects this uh, tome so it's, it allows him for an action um, he can test his intellect plus one and then if he passes he takes one horror and discards this card and gains a blood packed spell so he keeps that for now and he can use it when he wants that was his action and now um, he can take two movement now I don't remember you probably don't remember but when I was uh, during setup, I read the the prologue and it said that they heard some loud crash from the laboratory. So I think that's a hint. So they're going to head uh, over toward the laboratory. So he'll use his two movement to move one there. You know, he can move diagonal one and then his second movement to move into that door. Now he doesn't have another action to explore, so that's going to end his turn. All right, Jenny Bar Jenny. Uh, Barnes turn so she'll move one two that's her two movement and then she'll use her action to explore so the keeper would flip this card over if I can get it <laughs> and oh nothing of interest so they didn't find anything this just gets discarded okay that's both her movement and her action so that's going to end her turn so now we go on to the keeper's turn that's the investigator trading step so we'll say just to show what you know they can trade starting items or exploration cards so we'll say that Ashcan Pete decides he's going to give this to Jenny Barnes since her intellect is a little higher his is three hers is four so he's going to give that to her in the uh, investigator trading step of the keeper turn if either one of them had a stun token or more than one stun token, one of them would be removed at this point. But of course, neither one does. Alright, now it's the gain threat step. So we started with two investigators. So the uh, keeper gets to get gain two threat. So he started with one threat. So he's got three. Alright, the keeper action step. So he can spend his threat to... Uh, maybe do one of these actions. He doesn't have any monster minion currently on the board. He needs four threat to place a maniac on the board, so he's gonna not going to do that. Uh, he can't take a sample because he doesn't have a monster on the board. Uncontrollable urges. Uh, they can choose an investigator and then move him to an adjacent space or force him to resolve an action from one of his spell equipment artifact or tomb cards or tome cards. I don't think we're going to do that. We'll do this one. Evil Presence. Draw one Mythos and one Trauma. That costs one threat. So we'll discard this one threat. And we'll draw one Mythos card. Let's see. Alright. And one Trauma card. Alright. So if they somebody takes Horror, we can play this on them. All right, the keeper thinks he's going to go ahead and save his other two threat for the future and just end his keeper action step. Next is the monster attack step, but we don't have any monsters on the board. And finally, the event step, so we'll place a time token on the current event card. All right, that's going to end the keeper action step, so now are the keeper's turn, so now we go back to the investigators turn so they'll decide what order they're going to go in just to do something different we'll say Jenny Barnes is going to take her turn so uh, we'll say first thing she's going to do is her action and she'll go ahead and do this so she'll test her intellect plus plus one 
Uh, her intellect is 4 plus 1 is 5, so she's going to test against a 5. So she wants to roll a 5 or less. That's about a 50-50 chance. And she failed. There's no fail effect, so I guess she just keeps that. Um, something would have happened if she passed. I guess she wasn't smart enough to figure out what the nameless cult tome told her. I guess she can try that again in the future. But that's her action, so now all she can do is her movements. So she will move one into this room and one through this door. And that's going to end her turn. All right, Ashcan Pete's turn. He's going to move one into this space and his other movement to move in here. And he'll use his uh, action to explore. So the keeper would turn over this top card in this stack. Stack, it's an obstacle. And here we go, it's a puzzle. Power failure. Uh, the light in this room refuses to turn on. So pl place a darkness marker in the room. So we'll take one of these and put that we're in the operating room here. So we'll place that there. All right, and then it says uh, solve wiring puzzle 1A to discard this card and the darkness marker to continue exploring the room. So we got to find wiring puzzle uh, piece 1A. So this is 1A and you'll place it kind of how it's shown here. So it looks like the blue side to the left and the the red side to the right and then we have to randomly draw one two three four of the puzzle pieces that go with the wiring puzzle so I randomly shuffled this uh, stack so we'll draw four off of here and we start placing them just as they're shown here so one here one here one here and one here then we'll just place this stack back out of the way we may draw from it later then we turn them over and we place them with the arrow pointing up so this black arrow here so that will go facing up that way and there's the little black arrow there so that will go facing up that way and there so that faces that way and there's the little arrow there facing that way. So all these puzzles, if, if you're even if you're doing a different kind of puzzle, they have a little arrow so you'll always know which way they start and which orientation they start. And that arrow will be pointing up on whichever type of puzzle piece it is. So for example, if you were using this type of puzzle piece, this is the arrow, this pointed top edge. So you would place it um, with that top edge pointing up. But anyway, so now we've got our puzzle set up according to this. So now this will just go back up here. And uh, until we solve this puzzle, we can't uh, explore any further in there. Now I get one attempt to solve the puzzle. We got <clears throat> lucky with our starting orientation on that. Blue is connected to blue. Um, now remember, we can use our intellect, which I've only got an intellect of three, to uh, take actions to solve the puzzle. So we can shift a, a puzzle piece um, or, you know, swap it with another. So I can move this one up and this one down. And I can use one of my actions um, to rotate a piece 90 degrees. Or I can use two of my actions. And remember, I've only got three because my intellect is only three. I can use two of them to discard one of these pieces, um, put it at the bottom of the stack, and draw a new one and replace it. And it would start in its starting orientation with the arrow up. Also, um, I can use my skill point, discard one of my skill points, to add my luck to my intellect, giving me six actions I can take to solve this puzzle. So I think I'm going to do that, because um, I don't think three is very good. Now, if I, if I don't solve it, it remains um, however I've left it. And then on a future turn, Jenny could make an attempt to try to solve it, picking up where I left off, or I could make another attempt. But you only get one attempt per turn. So I'm going to discard one of my skill points, and that will give me 
um, six puzzle actions I can take to try to solve this. Alright, I think for my first action I'll swap these two. That's one, that gives me five actions left. For my second action I'll rotate this one 90 degrees. That gives me four actions left and I've made a connection there and there. But, now this one's going up there so that's not really helpful to me. So, for my third action I will swap these two. Uh, for my fourth action, I'll rotate this one 90 degrees. For my fifth action, I'll rotate this 90 degrees. I've got there, there, but I don't have there. And I've only got one more action left, so uh, I'm kind of in a pickle here. I think for my final action, I'll swap these. Alright, so I did not complete um, solving the puzzle at this point. I probably need to do a swap a piece out, but I needed two more actions. Anyway, so I didn't complete uh, the puzzle, um, but that's going to end old Pete's turn right there. So before this can be resolved, um, you know, like on the next turn, Jenny will have to try to solve it. But that's going to end the player's turn. So now we go on to the keeper. So first thing again is the uh, investigator trading step. I don't think they have anything they want to trade at this point. Next is the great gain threat step. So I get two because I started with two investigators or the keeper gets two. And I could have played on um, Pete's turn after one of his actions or his movements um, since uh, they're in that dark room. I probably could have played this on him, but that would have cost me one of my threat, and I wanted all four because I need to spend four to do this maniac attack. So I'm going to spend four threat. That's all I've got right now. And I'm going to do this. Um, choose a monster, or that's not maniac attack. If no maniacs are in play, choose a lone investigator. Oh, I don't have a lone investigator. There, There's two of them, so I can't do that. So let me get my fourth threat back. Dang, that spoiled my plan. Alright, well I'll do this then. Uh, choose an investigator. You may then move them, uh, him to an adjacent space. So I'm going to do that. So that's going to cost me two threat. And well, then I won't have enough. <laughs> I'll just do it for the heck of it. Alright. That's going to cost me two threat. I'll move Jenny Barnes to an adjacent space. And uh, that's all I'm going to be able to do. Uh, now we go to the event steps. I push another time token on the event card. So the next, my next turn, that'll put my third token and we'll resolve that. All right. I don't know if that really <laughs> did any good, but we will have uh, um, it's the investigator's turn we'll have Jenny go first she's going to use one of her movement to move into this room um, but uh oh she just ended a movement the uh, the keeper says he's going to play this on her because she's in a dark room costs him one threat he's going to spend that and he'll play this um, she, she's in a dark room through the dark you See a pair of red eyes slowly moving toward you. Take one whore, then the keeper may move you up to two spaces. So this gets discarded, but she's got to take a whore. So we'll put that on Janie. And then, oh, because she took a whore, he's got this uh, trauma card. If what it says here is true, then no pauses and clenches teeth. It is not true. Each time you see a tome card, each time you use a tome card or gain skill points, take one whore. So she will have that played on her. And then I get to move her up to two spaces, or the keeper gets to move her. So one, two. All right, so it's still her turn. All she had done is use one of her movement points. So she'll use her second movement point to move there. And uh, her third, or her action to run, so she'll move back in there. 
All right, we're back to Ashken Pete's turn. He's going to use his action to again work on this puzzle again. So he has his intellect of um, three. So I don't think he's going to discard one of these things. He's just going to use his three. So um, I think what he's going to do is he's going to try to replace this one. That's going to use two of his actions. So this will get discarded to the bottom of this pile and then he just will draw the top one and it goes with the arrow facing up so that was two of his actions he has one more he will uh, rotate 90 degrees and he's close to completing this but he didn't quite complete it because he's got blue blue but he needs a red, uh, red, red here, and then blue going up. So he's close to completing it, but it didn't, but he's out of. Um, he could spend another uh, skill point or another one of his things. Yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Um, when you're solving a puzzle, you can spend these at any point to add your luck which will give him three more when you're using these to roll a die, to re-roll a die, or to roll a die when you're adding to one of your attributes to test. You have to do it before you roll. All right, so he gets three more. So he's going to rotate this once. That's one of them, and that's all he needs to do. He's now completed the puzzle. Blue, blue, red, red, blue, blue. So from start to end, he's completed the puzzle. So we can just discard these pieces, put this back over here, discard these pieces to the bottom of the stack, and now uh, we discard this power failure um, and the darkness marker to continue exploring the room. So we'll discard this back here, This we can just discard it over here, and now the keeper will flip over the next card. Oh, we found a clue. The bloody mess of a man's body lies on the operating table. Rusted instruments and crude tools lie all around him. The skinless man whispers to you in horror through his lipless mouth. Oh God, he wanted my flesh. With his last breath, he murmurs, he let me stay the night and hands you a key. So, Ash Kim Pete will keep that. And then Keeper will flip the last card and it's a silver key. Discard this card when you attempt to move through a locked door to discard the locked door. So he will keep that. Ashcan Pete will keep that. And then Ashcan Pete uh, hasn't used any of his movement. So he'll use some movement and he'll go one, two. And all right. Um, so now we go back to the keeper's turn investigator trading step they're not in the same space so nothing's going to happen gain threat he gets to gain two threat um, keeper action step he's going to spend one to draw a mythos and a, and a uh, trauma card now he can only play this one on an investigator that's insane because they have to have zero sanity. He's not going to spend any more because he wants to uh, get enough threat to do this maniac attack. So he's done with his keeper action step. Now the monster attack step. He doesn't have any monsters out yet. So finally we go to the event step, which would put the third token on here. So I'm not going to bother to place it. I'll just remove the other two and we'll resolve this. Um, clock strikes one. If clue three has not been found, which we did find clue three, each investigator takes one whore. Otherwise, resolve the following. Well, we had three B, so we want to resolve three B. Skinless remains of a man throws open the door of the laboratory. Place a zombie in the foyer or foyer. Each investigator then takes one horror. So we'll place a zombie here, and then each investigator has to take one horror. So there's one for Pete, and there's one for Jenny, and then this is just discarded. 
All right, uh, I guess maybe we'll do one more round. Um, we'll have uh, Pete decides he wants to go first. Jenny says uh, that's fine. So he's going to move uh, one, two, now, well, one. Now he entered the same room as a uh, monster, so he's got to do a horror check. So the zombie gives him a minus, has a horror rating of minus one, so he gets minus one to his willpower, which is seven, so six, so he's doing a test. He's got to get six or less. He passes, so he doesn't have to take a horror. And he'll use his second movement to move here. And now he's in the same space as the zombie, so we'll say for his action, he's going to uh, use his guitar, um, and uh, let's see, one place towards you or discard this card to attack a monster in your space. So he's going to uh, discard this to attack a monster in his space. So I guess he's hitting him with it. It's a blunt melee weapon. So the keeper will now draw cards until we get something that says melee weapon or blunt melee weapon. That's arranged. Ranged. Ranged. Blunt melee weapon. All right. You raise your weapon in the air and grit your teeth. Test strength minus one. All right. Well, my strength is six minus one is five. So, again, only a 50% chance here. I'm successful. So, if you pass, your weapon comes down on its head with a sickly thump. Deal weapon damage plus two. Well, my weapon damage is 3, so plus 2 is 5, and I stun the monster. So let's check what he can take. Oh, he can only take 5 damage, so he's, he's dead. That zombie's dead. So that's pretty good. Alright, and now um, it is Jenny Barnes' turn. We'll say uh, she's going to try to do her tome again. Um, but each time she uses a tome card or gains a, uh, gains skill points, take one horror. So she's got to take one horror first. So that gives her three, so her sanity's down to seven. But she is going to test intellect plus one, so that her intellect is a four plus one is five. So again, 50% chance she's successful. So if she passed, take one horror. Oh, Lord, she's got to take another horror. That's not too good. She's taking a lot. Um, take one horror, discard this card, and gain a blood packed spell card. So we'll discard that. She'll get the top blood packed spell card. She can use this to, um, for an action, choose an investigator in your room to heal one damage. And then we don't know what happens when she until it, when she uses it. Then we flip it over and see what what happens. But she gains that. Now she has her two movement. So we'll say she's going to move one, two. All right, we'll finish the keeper's turn and then wrap it up. Now he could have probably played one. Oh, he could have played this on on uh, Ash Can Peak there because it costs zero threat. Um, but he forgot to do it. He could have done that when he moved in there. And he could play this on Jenny Barnes now because she just finished her, her movement. But he he doesn't want to spend two threat to do that, so... All right, anyway, so we go on to the keeper's turn. Investigator trade stab. They're not in the same room, so there's nothing they can't trade, so that doesn't matter. Gain threat. He's going to gain two threat. All right, keeper action step. He's going to go ahead and play this one now, so that costs four threat. And now he can do this. If no maniacs are in play, choose a lone investigator playing one maniac in his space, his or her space. So we'll choose one of our maniacs here. We'll choose this one. He's wielding an axe. And we'll put him in the space with Jenny Barnes there. Now because he's placed there, she immediately has to take a horror test. So it's her willpower um, minus one. So we'll look at her willpower as seven minus one is six. So she's got to test that. A five, she passes, so she doesn't have to take a horror. 
All right, he doesn't have any other threat, so that's going to end his keeper action step. But now we go to the monster attack step. So we do have a uh, monster in the room here in the same space as a uh, investigator. So that monster is going to attack Jenny. That uh, maniac is going to attack, J attack Jenny. So we'll flip over the top card. Monster attack. The monster charges you with <laughs> screaming gibberish. Test strength. So we'll test her strength, which is uh, four. That's not too good. She'll discard one of her skill points to add her luck, which makes it six. Still not very good, but something. So six. She rolled a two. She passes. All right. So we look. Uh, if there we go down here pass you grunt with effort and shove it away no effect so she doesn't take any damage all right that's going to uh, end the monster attack step because we only have one monster on the board now we go to the event step so we would take this event uh, time token put it on this event card it requires four before we resolve that and that will end the keeper turn and now we would go back to the investigators but uh, this video's gotten pretty long I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, I think the only thing we didn't show is an evade if Jenny tried to move out of here or do some action other than attack this maniac, then um, she would have to evade him. Again, testing her dexterity, uh, he wouldn't add any or subtract anything because he's got a zero in his awareness there. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, I know uh, Mansions of Madness 2 the app driven version of this game which I do have and is fun is has taken over Mansion of Madness 1 but I still I still uh, had a good time playing this I just kind of I just kind of enjoy this one I don't know that I enjoy it better than Mansions of Madness 2 but it's a good change of pace from the app driven version so uh, somebody had requested I do a video on this so uh, I'm glad to have done it. I hadn't, as I mentioned, I hadn't played this in a long time and I had a good time playing it. So uh, hopefully I can play it again in the near future. But I think that's going to do it for, for this one. Uh, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it.